Imagine waking up one morning to find that you have a twin brother on the opposite side of the world that you never knew about. He's just like you, except he's smarter than you, more successful than you, taller than you, and he has a German accent. I have a twin brother who lives on the opposite side of the world, but I never felt such an exhilaration of long-lost kinship until I stumbled upon this news headline last November. Zaha Hadid's successor. Scrap art schools, privatized cities, and bin social housing. A world-class architect talking about privatizing cities? Sounds like my kind of guy. When Joe and I started An Architecture Podcast two years ago, we said, let's apply anarcho-capitalist ideas to the built environment. Nobody's doing that. Well, there must be some natural law of the internet that whenever you think you have an original idea, you'll find someone smarter than you who has already done all the work. Enter Patrick Schumacher. He is the head of Zaha Hadid Architects, one of the largest and most visionary architectural firms in the world. But that's not all. He is also an architectural professor and lecturer, and an architectural theorist, and an author, and he is an unabashed anarcho-capitalist. He is the Arnold Schwarzenegger to my Danny DeVito. I, mean, I don't know what the problem is, but I'm sure it can be resolved without resorting to violence. Yeah. Okay? Welcome to An Architecture Podcast, episode number nine. I feel like I have license to make a Beatles joke here because at the moment I'm actually living in England, which has turned out to be a pretty fortunate thing, as I'll explain in a few minutes. It's been a while since we put out an episode, and in fact, even our last episode, episode eight, was an interview that we did for another podcast. So I guess we've been slacking off a bit. And there are a few reasons for that. For one thing, I ended up buying a new house last September. And Joe bought a new house in December. So we've both had a lot on our plates, although we have recorded some material for what will someday be the third and final episode in our Citizen of Nowhere series. We've put the Citizen of Nowhere series on hold for the moment, because we've had another topic come up that we want to discuss, and in fact we're going to make up for the delay and put it on an episode by publishing four episodes at the same time. As you've probably guessed from the introduction, this series is about Patrick Schumacher, the head of Zaha Hadid Architects. Patrick succeeded Zaha Hadid as the lead principal of the firm, following her untimely death from a heart attack while hospitalized for bronchitis in March of 2016. For anyone who might not be familiar with her, Dame Zaha Hadid was a revolutionary architect who has designed some of the most progressive and technically challenging buildings of the last 30 years. During her lifetime, she was awarded some of the highest honors in the architectural profession, including the Pritzker Prize, of which she was the first woman to win, as well as the RIBA gold medal in the United Kingdom. Patrick has worked alongside her since 1988 and became her trusted design partner as the firm grew from a paper architect studio with a handful of employees to an international practice with over 400 employees, completing landmark projects all over the world, such as the Aquatic Center from the 2012 Olympics in London. Despite their rapid growth, they've managed to maintain their avant-garde style of design and cutting-edge technological prowess. If you want to get a sense of what their projects and their approach to their work is about, they have a 10-minute promotional video on YouTube that they put out in 2014, which we'll link to in the show notes. Anybody who has even a passing interest in architecture should check out that video. It will blow your mind. So, that's all well and good, but what does that have to do with us? Why have we taken such an interest in Patrick here on An Architecture Podcast? Well, last November of 2016, Patrick gave a speech at the World Architecture Forum in Berlin on the topic of housing. It started, like most architecture presentations, with a review of some of Zaha Hadid Architects' recent residential projects. But then Patrick switched gears, and I'm not sure if this was a a bait-and-switch or if the audience had some kind of warning of this ahead of time. Uh, But he started talking about London's housing crisis, which over here is a a front-page news story. And specifically, he started talking about the impact of government policies on the housing market and how planning restrictions like minimum space standards, zoning of uses, and prescriptive unit mixes are stifling possibilities for creating more dense and affordable housing in central areas in London. 
He then went on to challenge social housing subsidies, rent control, and tenancy restrictions, pointing out how these policies distort the housing market. Finally, he proposed the wholesale privatization of public spaces and infrastructure to allow their value to be discovered by the market. He suggested that even Hyde Park, which is essentially London's equivalent of New York Central Park, could potentially be built over to create a whole new city within the center of London. So this was pretty radical stuff to be presenting at an architecture conference. I found out about this presentation a few days later in an article in The Guardian about it that I had mentioned in the introduction. The article noted some of these points from his speech and went on to describe his political philosophy of neoliberalism and even anarcho-capitalism. It listed some of its influences, including guys that we've mentioned on this show before, guys like Ludwig von Mises, Friedrich Hayek, Murray Rothbard, Peter Schiff, David Stockman, and even Tom Woods, whom our listeners may recognize as a guy who interviewed Joe and me on our last episode, number eight. So after reading this, I immediately went back and listened to Patrick's presentation, which the online design magazine, D-Zine, had recorded and posted, and we'll link to that in the show notes. Then I started digging into some of his published articles on his website, patrickschumacher.com. In particular, an article called The Stages of Capitalism and the Styles of Architecture, in which he explained how he had discovered the ideas of anarcho-capitalism and how they were compatible with his architectural theory, which he calls parametricism. So here I thought I was the only architect openly promoting libertarian anarcho-capitalist ideas, but no, there is another, and he's way more qualified than me. I was fascinated, not just in what he had to say, but in the fact that he existed in the first place. So I felt compelled to write something about this. The presentation had gotten some attention in the architectural press, as well as some mainstream media outlets like the Guardian article I mentioned. While there were some views in support of Patrick, most of the coverage was predictably negative, expressing shock and outrage at what Patrick had said, although there were very few arguments offered to challenge his proposals. I thought I could use this as an opportunity to write my own sort of manifesto of anarcho-capitalism, and then to ground Patrick's proposals within that broader theoretical framework as a defense of his ideas. So I wrote this blog post titled, Patrick Schumacher, Anarcho-Capitalist Architect, and I hope he accepts that label. I know he's talked about anarcho-capitalism in his writing, so I just went with it. So later in this episode, I'm going to read through that blog post just to give an introduction to Patrick and his ideas and an overview of the controversy that followed his presentation. So I posted this blog post on our website, which got copied to Facebook and Twitter, and the next day I got a message on Twitter from Patrick, the man himself, that was really appreciative of the article and, and asked us who we were. So I don't know, maybe he was just as surprised to find us as we were to find him. As Murray Rothbard once put it, one libertarian is a lone nut, two libertarians are two lone nuts, but three libertarians, that's a school of thought. We exchanged a few notes, and over the following weeks, we each started retweeting some of each other's posts. Now, in episode six, I talked about how I had taken a year off from my job as an architect to be a stay-at-home dad traveling the world with my young family. Well, the year went so well that we've doubled down and are now spending five months abroad living in Cambridge, England, and visiting other places from there. Since I'm just an hour north of London, where Patrick's office is, I thought I'd reach out to see if he would consider an interview for our podcast. And sure enough, he agreed to do it. So a couple of weeks ago, I hopped on a train to the Zaha Hadid Design Gallery in London, which exhibits furniture pieces and other prototypes designed by the firm. And if you're ever in London, it's definitely worth a visit. It's unusual for an architecture firm to have its own public gallery. And the, the kind of forms and fabrication techniques that they showcase there are really pretty inspiring. So I got in there and I originally set up the microphones at this kind of space age looking clear acrylic table in the middle of the gallery space, which probably would have been the coolest place I could ever have possibly recorded a podcast. But apparently there was a tour group scheduled to come through. So we ended up moving upstairs to a table in, in one of their open office work areas. So not quite as glamorous, but it was neat to have a peek behind the curtain to see uh, to see where, where the magic happens at Zaha Hadid Architects. And hopefully the employees didn't mind overhearing us. I'm sure they're used to hearing Patrick sound off on some of this stuff. So we did the interview, and I was really happy with the way it went, and Patrick was very generous with his time. So after the interview, Patrick and I got talking a little bit, and he invited me to a salon discussion the following night, where a handful of people within the architecture profession were getting together to discuss the topic of politics in architecture. 
So of course I was flattered that that he thought that I could actually contribute something worthwhile to this discussion. And the next night I got on the train back to London and met up with this group of other people within the profession to hash it out. So that was a lot of fun. It was a very lively debate. There were people representing a broad range of political positions. And when it was over, everybody went down the street to the pub for drinks. Well, except for Patrick, because he was being interviewed by the BBC that night about the housing topic. So it looks like this group is going to plan to meet again, so hopefully I'll have more to report on that in the future. But all in all, getting to see Zaha Hadid Architect's office, getting to meet Patrick, going through the interview, and then uh, participating in this salon discussion the following night has been a really amazing experience for me. And I want to thank Patrick for agreeing to do this and for trusting us to try to help communicate some of his views to the broader world. There's a lot to talk about here. Obviously, we want to talk about the housing issues, but I didn't want to spend the interview rehashing the housing issue with Patrick. I feel like by this point, he's kind of said his piece about it. We've made our comments about it in the article that I'm going to read here in a few minutes. So instead, we focus the interview on Patrick's work in architectural theory. He's written a 450-page book called The Autopoiesis of Architecture, in which he spells out a very comprehensive analysis of current and past theories of architecture and what the role of architectural theory should be within the profession. But apparently that wasn't enough. So he then issued volume two of The Autopoiesis of Architecture, which is just as long as the first book, and gets more into his preferred theory and style of architecture, which he has called parametricism. And this style isn't unique to Zaha Hadid Architects. It's building off of the work of a number of firms from the 90s into the 2000s, who started to break away from modern and postmodern traditions within architecture to develop building forms that were more curvilinear and fluid. And as you'll hear Patrick describe in the interview, he feels that this style of architecture is best suited to our complex contemporary society. So I won't say much more about that here. For that interview with Patrick, you can jump ahead to episode 11. But for this episode and the following episode, Joe and I wanted to address the housing controversy to give some background to Patrick's views and some context for our conversation with him. So in this episode, I'm going to read the blog post I had written, summarizing his presentation and the controversy that followed it. And in the next episode, Joe and I are going to review some of the responses that came out in the media following his presentation. Not just to defend Patrick, but because these kind of responses, for one thing, they're kind of a rarity. It's not often that these kind of radical libertarian ideas even get mentioned in mainstream media formats, let alone in the architecture profession. So for us, it's interesting to see how these views are perceived and interpreted when they're circulated to a mainstream audience. So that will be episode number 10. But again, if you just want to hear what Patrick has to say, feel free to jump ahead to the interview in episode 11. So that's it for the administrative details. Now, without further ado, this is a blog post I wrote on December 6, 2016, entitled Patrick Schumacher, Anarcho-Capitalist Architect. When were you last in Hyde Park? How much are you actually using it? We need to know what it costs us. Patrick Schumacher might as well have suggested blowing up the moon when he proposed that Hyde Park in London should be privatized for development. In a presentation at the World Architecture Festival 2016 in Berlin, Schumacher argued that London's housing crisis is due to constraints imposed by government policies. In his Urban Policy Manifesto, he outlined eight demands for radical reductions of regulation and subsidies, and even private ownership of infrastructure in public spaces. This polemic has predictably catapulted him into controversy, with some applauding his courage while others condemn his callousness dubbing him the Trump of architecture. But Schumacher is not some alt-right Twitter troll living in his parents' basement. He is the director of Zaha Hadid Architects, a 400-person international design firm that has produced some of the world's most remarkable buildings of the last three decades, including the Haidar Aliyev Center in Azerbaijan and the London Aquatic Center for the 2012 Olympics. Schumacher was named director after the untimely death in March 2016 of Dame Zaha Hadid, the groundbreaking Pritzker Prize winner whom Schumacher has worked alongside since 1988. While he has clearly stated that his political views are his own and do not represent the firm, and the firm's trustees have emphatically agreed, his position adds gravitas to what might otherwise be easily dismissed by the traditionally left-leaning architectural profession 
as irrelevant blasphemy. The Theory of Anarcho-Capitalism To try to pin Schumacher down on the left-right political spectrum is to misunderstand his stance altogether. He espouses anarcho-capitalism, a political theory that rejects the legitimacy and efficacy of government in solving the problems of society. An anarcho-capitalist may share some of the end goals of both the left and the right, yet disagree with both on the moral and practical means of achieving those ends. To an anarcho-capitalist, the means of government are the means of force, which Schumacher described as police force, the power to shut down, clamp down, and put you out. Anarcho-capitalism is derived from the non-aggression principle, which holds that the initiation of physical force is morally wrong, although defensive force may be justifiable. Unlike any other form of societal organization, the state claims legitimate authority to initiate force against people without their consent. This force is manifested in the threats of attack or imprisonment that compel compliance with taxation, regulation, and military action. This moral imperative of non-aggression provides sufficient reason to oppose the state regardless of the practical outcomes of such opposition. The ends, however noble, can never justify the means of governmental initiation of force. However, anarcho-capitalists argue that a truly voluntary market economy could produce greater prosperity at all levels of the economy. Individuals engaging in voluntary trade each gain more perceived value than what they give away. A market of such transactions establishes prices that inform producers of what, how much, and when to produce certain goods, such as housing. The market becomes a decentralized network of information, allocating scarce resources to satisfy the varied demands of individual consumers. When governments use confiscated capital to subsidize particular goods and services, artificially inflated prices distort this information resulting in a wasteful misallocation of resources. Similarly, regulations that obstruct voluntary trade systematically distort prices, creating schisms between supply and demand that can lead to perceived shortages like the London housing shortage. Anarcho-capitalists argue that removal of governmental distortions to voluntary exchange and production would allow the necessary price corrections to occur. This would promote a more efficient allocation of resources to satisfy the diversity of consumers' wants and engender greater human flourishing at all levels of the socioeconomic spectrum. Anarcho-capitalism is not a panacea, however. It cannot eliminate scarcity, inequality, hatred, or violence, but nor can any other political-economic system. What it can eliminate is the legitimacy granted to governments or anyone else who attempts to achieve their ends using the means of the initiation of force. Anarcho-capitalist urbanism Patrick Schumacher has taken a bold step to attempt to convince his colleagues and the world that the legitimacy granted to government intervention is unnecessary and unwarranted. It is within this context of anarcho-capitalism that Schumacher's analysis and demands need to be considered. He says that in London, the key decisions that should be entrepreneurial decisions are fixed politically, noting arbitrary prescriptions of land use allocation, program elements, density, unit mixes, unit sizes, room sizes, and even balconies. Such over-restrictive regulations result in haggling between developers and planners so that developers compete solely in terms of gaming the planners rather than creating unique value. Anarcho-capitalists reject this conceit of the omniscience of central planners, whether in the economy or the built environment. Information about consumers' values is diffused among the dynamic network of all market participants, communicated to producers through prices. Those who best anticipate the demands of consumers and efficiently allocate resources are rewarded with profit, and those who do not suffer losses. When this role of anticipated demand is monopolized by a government central planner with no skin in the game, widespread and enduring misallocations of resources result in oversupply or shortages. Schumacher describes how London's housing policies have generated an oversupply of middle-income units despite a shortage of overall units. Schumacher broadens his criticism to the urban fabric. You have the pretense of land-use planning, 
where the whole point is that only the market can discover the synergies, the co-locational synergies and relevancies of various things tying together into an urban network. Anarcho-capitalism enables the kind of idiosyncratic entrepreneurial development that makes urban areas vibrant and unique. Often, what keeps people coming back to a place is not the grandeur of an orchestrated public space, but the individual shops, restaurants, and businesses that have emerged to breathe life into it. Schumacher's first four demands, to restrain planners, abolish land use prescriptions, stop attempts at milieu protection, forced preservation of the character of a neighborhood, and abolish housing design standards, express this anarcho-capitalist principle that government simply doesn't know best. This acknowledges that no individual, even a well-intentioned expert city planner, is able to ascertain the vast amount of time-sensitive information being communicated among all market participants in a diffuse manner. This does not mean that markets will always get it right. Markets make mistakes. The crucial advantage markets have over controlled economies is that markets can correct their mistakes and make producers accountable for them through profit and loss. In contrast, state planners do not even know when they have made a mistake. They are a disinterested third party, unaccountable to the producers and consumers, who suffer losses from their edicts. Markets can adapt to new information, while the mistakes of central planners can metastasize for decades. Anarcho-capitalist social housing Schumacher has received some sympathy for his criticisms of prescriptive planning and design standards. Much more controversial are his proposals for housing low-income individuals. In his next three demands, Schumacher proposes abolishing all forms of social and affordable housing, home buying subsidies, rent control, and tenancy restrictions. Arguments that home buying subsidies artificially inflate home prices and that rent control and tenancy restrictions reduce the supply of rental units are hardly controversial among economists of any stripe. But his call to phase out the public benefit system has been construed as a direct attack on the poor. What has been missed in these inflammatory news media soundbites is an important caveat Schumacher stated. To substitute housing benefits with monetary support without specific purpose allocation. In other words, government would still subsidize low-income individuals with the same amount of money. But the recipient would have the choice of spending that money either on their housing or on their other priorities. Like everyone else, they could choose to spend more to live in a central location or to move out of the city center and save money. This presents more options to the recipient and reduces the distortion of housing prices. Of course, this is no anarcho-capitalist proposal. Is Schumacher conceding that government is still needed to steal from the rich to give to the poor? Government welfare programs give people a false sense of charity, allowing them to think they do not need to directly contribute to causes they care about because the government is taking care of it. They also waste the efforts of proponents who focus resources on electioneering and lobbying rather than on direct aid and fundraising. Anarcho-capitalism would bring the same efficiencies and value discovery mechanisms to the market for charity as it would to the market for goods and services. The expectation of a fully realized anarcho-capitalist society is that it would develop the charitable institutions needed to help those who need it. As Schumacher's detractors have demonstrated, There is a powerful desire among many to address the needs of the less fortunate, and with more tax dollars left in their pockets, they could be expected to do just that. In the housing market, charitable organizations could either offer their own housing subsidies or purchase buildings to offer rental units to their preferred tenants at below market rates. Or, as Schumacher presented, new forms of micro-unit or communal housing could bring market affordability to city centers. However, this infrastructure of charitable organizations and market solutions would take time to develop. Schumacher's proposal for unallocated monetary support from the government is an interim compromise. It would serve as a bridge to allow society to transition to a point at which all government functions could be replaced by voluntary institutions. The Selling of Hyde Park Perhaps the most outrageous of Schumacher's demands is his call to privatize all streets, squares, public spaces, and parks, possibly whole urban districts. In his most enfant terrible moment, he suggests that London's Hyde Park should be privatized, with the possibility of building a new city over 80% of it. 
and even Hyde Park. I mean, there's historic preservation. I'm not going to be against that in principle. But imagine if we can, in 80% of Hyde Park, build a new city within the center of London, according to the highest bidding value proposition. You can still keep a nice 20%. And I'm asking you, I know a lot of you are Londoners, when were you last in Hyde Park? How much are you actually using it for the benefit? This is perhaps the most unique and challenging feature of anarcho-capitalism. In the absence of government, what are now government assets would necessarily be owned by non-government entities. There are theories of how streets, parks, and public spaces could emerge and function in the absence of a state, but the transition from a state to a stateless society requires a more complex divestiture of state property and services. Schumacher does not detail a method of divestiture for Hyde Park, but he implies a direct sale or auction, with the cash paid being returned to taxpayers. How do we find out what this costs us? When we actually can make a bidding process and see what value we are forgoing and we could gain, and lower taxes and give all of us more prosperity. In recognition of the long-standing public use of the land, a better approach might be for the government to bequeath the land to a for-profit corporation or non-profit trust with all citizens receiving voting ownership shares. This land trust could then decide whether to preserve the park with deed covenants or sell portions of the land for development. Shares could be bought by those who feel strongly about the land from those who do not, to increase their influence on the decision-making and allow the value of ownership to be discovered. Critics may rightly point to corruption in some historical examples of industrial privatization. Because government confiscation of tax money and property is arbitrary and irrational, it is difficult to define a divestiture process that is not equally arbitrary and irrational. Even in a well-intentioned divestiture, there would be winners and losers. But there are winners and losers in the status quo of government ownership and maintenance of property assets as well. As Schumacher points out in an extended quote that was cut from the news media soundbite, we need to know what this costs us, what this costs all of us, and what this costs residents in Scotland, that we are actually protecting this and preventing this. Indeed, why should farm workers in Scotland be taxed to pay for a lush park in the wealthiest neighborhood in the United Kingdom? Who owns Hyde Park? Even if this unfairness can be acknowledged, Schumacher's idea of selling Hyde Park still seems like an unprecedented extreme measure. But it is not. Hyde Park has been sold once before. After the 1649 execution of Charles I, Parliament began selling crown lands to raise money for Oliver Cromwell's military campaigns. In 1652, Hyde Park was sold as three lots to Richard Wilson, John Lacey, and Anthony Dean for a total sum of £17,068. However, when Charles II returned to the throne in the Restoration of 1660, these lot sales were deemed null and void. Ownership of Hyde Park was reassumed by the new king. Any question of whether the king was right to void these property purchases is now academic. But it raises a crucial question. Who holds a legitimate title to Hyde Park? The land that is now Hyde Park was confiscated by the tyrannical Henry VIII from Westminster Abbey during the Reformation, when he decimated the monasteries of England. The king wanted the land to extend his exclusive hunting grounds, in particular for game of hare, Partridge, pheasant, and heron. Imagine the outrage today if Donald Trump were to announce that he would use his presidential power to confiscate a large piece of land in a major city exclusively for his own personal amusement. No one would consider this to be a legitimate transfer of title. Yet that is exactly the nature of the title that the British government claims for Hyde Park. Hyde Park is stolen land, the legacy of a tyrant, and a symbol of political privilege that persists to this day in Great Britain and in every other nation that grants legitimacy to those who govern by threat of force. The legitimacy of the government's ownership of Hyde Park should be rejected, and the park should be divested to its rightful owners, the people. This delegitimization of government should not stop at Queen Elizabeth Gate. Through confiscation, coercion, and conquest rather than commerce and cooperation, modern governments claiming authority to initiate force have constructed an edifice of power, privilege, and property that has gone unquestioned for centuries. Patrick Schumacher's questioning of this legitimacy is long overdue.
the pariah Schumacher. In the days following his presentation, Patrick Schumacher has been denounced and ostracized by protesters, politicians, the press, the architectural profession, and his own practice. His speech was intended to be provocative, but while it has fomented a firestorm of incredulity, dismissiveness, and name-calling, it has not provoked the kind of debate he may have been hoping for. Not one of his critics has taken up the intellectual challenge of refuting his specific ideas based on their merits. Schumacher appears to have been humbled by this vociferous backlash, expressing regret for the embarrassment felt by his friends and colleagues. However, in a mea culpa released in the days following his speech, he reaffirmed his vision for the potential of anarcho-capitalism to create a better society for all. I envision a society based on free association and mutually voluntary interactions and exchanges, where we grant each other more degrees of freedom and believe in each other's capacity of self-responsibility and charity where the rules of interaction can be explored, discovered, and allowed to evolve, and where organizational and moral standards emerge and adapt to new challenges and technological opportunities in a dispersed, bottom-up process of discovery and cumulative selection and validation, rather than via majority rule. Ideally, without too many foreclosing impositions, from a control center that is lacking the information processing capacity to adequately cope with increasing levels of complexity and dynamism of our global society. That's right. You're fired. You have no respect for logic. But he's got an axe. And I have no respect for those with no respect for logic. You tell your brother he messes with me, he messes with my whole family.